Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I welcome a guest who is helping our community scale their businesses. What is scaling? Why is it important? And why should an entrepreneur care? Scaling a business means setting the stage to enable to support growth in the company. It means having the ability to grow without being hampered. It requires planning, some funding, and the right systems, staff, processes, technologies, and partners. Scaling growth is about creating business models and designing your organization in a way that easily scales in order to generate consistent revenue growth and avoid stall points without adding a ton of extra costs and or resources along the way. Before I go forward, I need to make a note that there is a difference between growth and scaling. In business, we think of growth in linear terms. A company adds new resources, so capital, people, or technology, and its revenue increases as a result, according to Spend Journal. By contrast, scaling is when revenue increases without a substantial increase in resources. Business growth takes a lot of resources to sustain consistent growth. Like the old saying goes, entrepreneurs need to have money to make money. According to the recent CFO Connect Summit, financial growth can be only achieved while making large losses. Scaling, on the other hand, is achieved by increasing revenue without increasing costs significantly. The importance of scaling is vast. It helps entrepreneurs enter new markets. It can help entrepreneurs establish multiple domestic and international entities and grow entrepreneurs' profits without taking on too much additional business costs. According to Mattiness, scalability includes scaling all facets of the business, such as hiring and employee contracts, team communication, management strategies, project management, client relations, marketing efforts, automated tasks, ongoing training, internal processes, expenses and payroll management, product development, and manufacturing and distribution. So we know scaling is important, but how can it be done? Here are Skelto's five keys to help your business grow. First, the entrepreneur should know their potential customers. What are they doing? What do they like? And how do they seek information? According to Skelto, people receive about a thousand brand messages from text messages, WhatsApp messages, and online ads and street advertising a day. The company's task is to grab the attention of potential customers in a saturated landscape. The entrepreneur should focus on what the consumer wants, understand the specific need the customer has. The entrepreneur may want to create a website to create an online sales channel. However, according to Halasio Ginolette, CEO of Ogilvy Latin America, global brand manager in Coca-Cola, and a member of Ogilvy's global enterprise leadership team, this may generate 3% of the entrepreneur's sales. But if the entrepreneur develops a different and innovative product, sales may increase by 50%. Build the brand. A strong brand is a credibility and value is like a spotlight that makes the business shine brighter and invites the customer to say, I want that brand. According to Skelto, customers value brands regardless of low cost. Mass production companies know this and continue to invest in their brand. Identify the value offer. Add a differentiator. Dedicate time to it. Aim to build a strong brand and evolve services. Work in a more integrated way. Due to the complexities of marketing today, according to Skelto, the entrepreneur must work in an integrated way with different partners. They can be technology, data, process issues, or creative collaborations. Lastly, creativity cannot be automated, per Skelto. Creativity is the entrepreneur's differentiator. It is the added value the entrepreneur can bring to the company. The entrepreneur cannot buy it from an agency. It is unique and it is part of the entrepreneur themselves. I used to say I'm like a sponge. I love absorbing information. But Gabriela Polida, founder of Skelto, has taught me I need to treat myself and my business more like a plant. Quote, growing a business takes time. Similar to a plant, it needs attention and dedication in order to thrive. With the right tools, advice, and support, you can make customers prefer your brand. And that is why the entrepreneur should care. Scaling at the right time has many benefits, but premature scaling can happen when the business expands faster than the business is ready for. Overhiring and rapid market expansion are common examples of premature scaling. The entrepreneur should be thoughtful about their growth strategy. Scale at a pace that is right for you and your business. And if you do not know how to scale, give Gabrielle a call. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Shades of 
Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. has worked for over 300 brands globally, focused on Latin American and Hispanic clients to provide the ability to implement the best-in-class brand and communication solutions. She is the founder of Scalto. Please welcome Gabriela Polido. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with the founder of Scalto, Gabriella. How are we doing? So, Gabrielle, great. How are you? Good. I'm excited. We were talking a little bit about the, the company. Now, the reason I'm excited about this one in particular is it really focuses a lot on some Latino communities. In fact, you have a lot of Latino employees. We we're talking a little bit about your background, but first let's inter- go ahead and introduce the audience. Who is Gabriela? Give them some background, education, career. So I'm a serial entrepreneur, mother of four. I have a background in engineering and I started my company for, uh, I started my first company at uh, 2004 with branding agency and it was set off to build after management consulting and, and the engineering background. I started off saying, okay, the brand is important, it's relevant. And we started developing like strong brands in Venezuela, Colombia, Chile, Argentina, and the U.S., um, and, and it came to a point where uh, coming from developing and sourcing or trying to figure out what the value of a brand, I came across as soon as I migrated to the U.S., which is five years ago, fast forward, I decided that things or the brand can importantly play an important role in terms of leveraging growth of companies. And I created Scalto just because I actually, I truly believe that you can um solve for creative sort of scaling problems creatively with the branding and communication side so yes it's hispanics from the essence i'm born and raised in venezuela but i studied in new york at columbia engineering and then also uh what we do is more on how to solve for uh problems in terms of scaling from companies in the u.s and latin america and going back and forth is also that's important uh, aspect of it. Nice. So n- you mentioned um, that you actually migrated here to the United States about five years ago. So let's kind of, how has it, what are some difficulties as a, a migrant trying to start your own business? Are there some, you know, red tape that you had to run through that you found that you had to go through that maybe some other folks might be aware of or might be unaware so of? My fir- so yeah. So my first company had already businesses in New York and Dubai, Mexico, Colombia, Venezuela, which I exited like right before COVID hit, which is March 1st. I exited my company and then I started Scalto on March 31st, 2000. I decided not to delay it just because I, we didn't know what COVID was ta- was going right. to do with it, the impact of it. But I said, I do have a clarity as to what my goal was, my my vision was uh, in terms of help, helping companies scale. And uh, which it was, it was different, definitely, Gabrielle. It was different in terms of scaling companies on the normal side, but scaling companies on, on the on the restrictive restrictive pattern. It was uh, tough. So um, that that for me was uh, a key point of, of learning, understanding, listening, what was happening. Other differences were in terms of market and, and who my ideal customer was and my ideal client. Uh, there are different needs, different targets, different, um, even if you speak Spanish or if you speak English, if you speak English from New York, if you speak English from the UK and, and there's different backgrounds, it's not the same. Everybody speaks Spanish. So it's, it's called differently and it's, it's addressed differently. One's more formal, might other be more, a bit more outgoing. 
uh, when I came into Miami, just uh, they, we call this like the, the, the city of Latin, the, the capital of Latin America. We hear uh, people speaking Spanish from all over the places. Then I came here. I was like, what is it that's really the problem? So one of the key problems that they would come up to me is like companies from second, already second, third generation, trying to build them or bring it into the business. And this father came to me, he's like, I don't know how to get my son involved and in, in getting into the business. And they don't want it. They want nothing to do with this. So I said, okay, let's figure it out. And, and what do we devise a strategy? And we divide the, where are you heading? Where do you want, where do you see this company going? And why don't we bring them in in terms of opportunities? Sort of thing? And then what's your brand doing? And the brand was outdated, was this and that. So like, why don't we put them and get them excited? So these millennials or these generations, uh, the next generations were more on the purpose driven. Okay, why don't we get that into that narrative? And it got it excited. And, and it, it, it was, for me, it was an important aha moment where companies, and, and and families are we're struggling to 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 scale and, and to grow farther from the second or third generation just because people are not into or the kids were not interested how can you change that and then that struck struck as this is an important angle uh, it was that it was a, a school that wanted to completely change the landscape of Dural in, in Florida or even a wealth management firm that was integrated and growing. So there are different instances where how can the brand actually push and move uh, towards the next, uh, take, take people, companies to the next level. How, how does a company, how does a company scale? What are some tactics that you kind of help companies use to one, either determine if they're ready to scale and then two, scale it? So we, that's a great question. So we do actually uh, a scalability assessment at the beginning. And we, what we look for is what's your vision? What's your, where are you think, where do you think you're heading? And we provoke like different angles. Maybe this is not, this is just uh, uh, trying to go with, uh, with the flow. No, why don't we challenge this? Well, how might you think differently? What's going on? So we provoke different um, ideas or aspects and bring creatively in. And if you see the growth options differently, trying to push three steps ahead instead of having that tunnel vision, trying to look laterally at what's happening. And the next uh, was, okay, from that strategy, what is your narrative? So in, in my business, what you don't communicate is not known. But it, if you communicate something wrong, it's also against you. So why don't we devise the right strategy, the right communication, the right concept? And from then, we see the branding and what the brand is doing. And after you devise, okay, this is a strategy, this is your narrative, then how is your experience? You devise what's your customer journey? What are the touch points? Where are the pain points? Where are they struggling? So they would not like to be in a bank where they spend hours and hours in, their, in line. No, they want to do something differently. And those are the things that for a company or a uh, entrepreneur or a, a, a small early stage startup, think about your strategy, think about what's your narrative, what's your story, put it in that cohesively, put it in, and, and be recent and frequently and, and consistent in the execution and then device your uh, experience that you like. So that's it in a nutshell, that's what we call our blueprint, Scouter blueprint. Um, and in essence, that's, uh, it, it, it can be simple, in a way, so the first one you go about it, determining your why, why is it that you exist? And, and there's a great, um, I don't know, the, a, a super admired Simon Sinek approach where you have your golden circle, define it. Define it where you are going, what do you think you're unique? Where do you think you're unique? And it's like, why do you exist? How are you different than that? what you do, uh, you generate or you, produce. And from then the branding side, uh, I hesitate a bit in terms of the whole automated AI logo generators, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. because your competition is also doing the same. Yep. So you need to figure out how are you unique? And, and if everybody's using those type of generators, how might you um, differentiate and, and not confuse your, your consumer also. 
um, that those are the key things. I don't know, Gabrielle, if that answers your question. No, that perfect. In fact, one of the things you mentioned was, you know, differentiation, differentiating yourself from your, your customers. How did you, cause you're starting a business, you know, during the pandemic, how did you market and brand yourself to differentiate your company, Scalto, into other, what other, other companies are doing? So what we did is define a niche. Uh, the typical niche, the riches are in the niches. We, yeah. yeah, we did. We, we are, we are attending or generating solutions for service-based companies, B2B companies, small, mid-sized ones. And we're also doing specializing in fintechs and financial services, just because Miami, the whole Miami tech scene is really, it's real. Yeah. It's- so you see a lot of, uh, you, you see a lot of um, wealth management, uh, financial advisors and, and one not happening. So we, we niched into that. And then it, it came to a point is listening, what was happening, what was in their mind. So in one essence was how can I get back to selling when we're coming out of COVID or within the, in the midst of COVID, how can I get my back? to selling? how can I get back excited about this? So we're pulling the branding and the communication aspects for not only externally, but also internally to the, to the, their collaborators, their, their team members, everybody that get them excited. And uh, that's what we did. And the other thing that worked re- really well for us is that we productized our offer. So in a way we started saying, okay, this is our blueprint. This is our product. This is what we're doing. And this is what we're not doing. So we're not a design agency. We're a consultancy that we're doing this and trying to figure out how um, to narrow the or yeah, streamline what you do and systematize it as, as much as you can. Nice. Now, what, what kind yeah. of motivates you? What keeps you going? You mentioned you sold your old or you, you decided to step away from the other business before the pandemic started this business. What continues to motivate you? So I'm super curious. I like to learn. I like to see. I like a challenge. I like to provoke. Uh, when I saw myself working for my previous company, which I was happy about it, generating the brands and generating everything, it's like, okay, you know what, Gabby, this is the agency model. I think it's it's it, it, it's stepping is is getting to a point where it needs to pivot, it needs to pivot to towards a a do it yourself model as opposed to a do everything for the client. And how might you shift and how might I be successful at it? I found um, a, a great partner and I have my partners, uh, which I, I, I'm super proud of. They, they challenge me and they, so when I come with the ideas, I'm more like a, a visionary in terms of what I like, what I think, and they challenge me. And this time around, I said, okay, this is, this is something that I want, I want to pursue and make things happen differently. And that's what I've been doing in terms of the typical consultancy approach is more of the consultants working and doing everything for the client and delivering it. I like to work with the client or even the, the client does work and we, uh, we give feedback or we actually help them grow. Uh, like to learn, like to super curious. And also I'm impressed and things of, of an awe that, that I, I see in the market. I see, uh, even what I'm saying in Miami tech scene, I never thought that would be possible or feasible. And they say, okay, is it real? It's like, yes, it's real. Is it? It's not only the Bitcoin and the NFTs and whatnot. It's, it's the environment that's happening here. That it, it's exciting. It's, 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 it's great to be in a thriving community um, and coming from where I, I was coming, I was coming from Venezuela, which was, uh, which is, and uh, struggling in, in many politically and many different aspects. So here I'm growing. Yeah. And I, I got to admit, you know, I actually read an article like two, three years ago um, in the Wall Street Journal talking about how Miami is going to become the next Silicon Valley. And it's coming to fruition slowly. You know, they're probably not at the scale of Silicon, certainly, but they're getting there. It seems like a lot of tech industries, a lot of a lot of great innovation is starting to come out of the Miami area. Now, well, uh, Andrew Horowitz is moving is to Miami Beach uh, that we just heard of this morning. So that's that's an important thing. Yeah, that's very true. Yep. Now, what as a business owner, what are some things that keep you up at night? Um, 
And that's a very good question. As a business owner, as an entrepreneur myself, uh, I went to through an exercise, which I thought was incredible. It's like, okay, what can I get myself fired uh, out of? Because I was might might be doing maybe too much micromanaging, or maybe I was doing too much of a, a spreading myself myself too thin, and not thinking about the long term and growing. So I told my partner, it's like, you know what? I'm firing myself from this job. You are completely empowered and entitled and perfectly capable of doing it. We're ready, and we set off so that he takes care of that side of the business. So, what keeps me up at night? Trying to stay honest with my capacity to grow and, and look for uh, growth opportunities. Um, the other thing is, is, is when, when you draw the line, when this is not interested, interesting for me, or, or maybe this is too cumbersome. It's like, try to figure out who is the right person for the job that you don't, you're not excited about, you're not passionate about, but it needs to happen within the, your business. So that's also getting the right talent for me is, is something that uh, I do pay particular attention. You know, you, you've actually, your team in particular currently worked with a lot of clients. I was, I was looking on your website. You've worked with a lot of teams already. How do you continue to get new clients, especially, you know, like you mentioned, starting the pandemic era, how does you continue to grow? How do you continue to scale? So the, the basic aspect is that we have a roster of, uh, and you asked me at the beginning, how is it different in South America or Venezuela from Miami? It's just, I didn't go, I didn't need to go to sell in Venezuela because I was like the number one and number two in the market. So here, come here, it's like, okay, how do you get that ball rolling? And, and get that ball rolling between your clients, your current clients, it's the number one. It's everybody says it. It's 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 true. Go for the your current clients. Go for your past clients, and that's what we did. We also did um, some lead generation with uh, LinkedIn, which is our figure out where where is your connected connecting uh, platform. And for us, it was LinkedIn. For others, it's Facebook. For others, it's Instagram. Even this NFT platform, it's that we're doing the business. They're they're more in Discord or Twitter. So I, what I actually uh, got my, my strategy, got my messaging, and then I got to the right channels. And that's what I did. I did a campaign. And uh, I'm also part of a digital mastermind group. I'm, I'm, I'm a group of business owners just like me. And we're also constantly feeding uh, new ideas and new things that, have, that works also. And within that group, one of the things, aspects that was highlighted for me was uh, the EOS system. I don't know if you're, you're mm. aware of it, the enterprise operating system. And for me, it's it, it just like a big, it was a big, I know balance scorecard. I have done business process design. I've done all these other um, business strategy or business management uh, protocols. But this one was simple. This one was just for us, and we try to manage our business for that. So then keep it clear as to where you want to go, get the systems right, and then measure them. So that's what EOS is working for us. So let's for the listeners at home, can you give them a little background? What is EOS? So EOS is for is a is an operating system like the Mac has an operating system within. So it's how you should manage your business to cover most the most bases of, of it. So you you have clarity as to where you're heading, how are you doing, and how are you managing. So it's more, and I'm not an EOS implementer. I just implemented in my company a, a year and a half ago, which is a great because you have your vision. You have the people, in the, and it says have the, the right people in the right seats, which is great, yep. and have accountability charts, and then have what you have, your processes, have your, uh, your resources aligned to it, and then have data that you can cover and you can figure out where you're doing. And it has a structure where it has a rhythm where you set what the issues are, but then you solve for those issues. It's not a long, long list of to do, which I dread. It's something that it, it's actually you see traction, you see things uh, moving, and uh, you can have your dashboard, have everything done, 
you can have super simple, get the book, it's called Traction and read it um, from, from the EOS um, team. But that's in, in uh, however you want to manage your business, you need to have, it needs to be run, you need to know the numbers. So those numbers need to be clear and needs to be on the top of your head. If you're the business owner and you're this entrepreneur, I come, like, for instance, I do a lot of mentorship for Endeavor um, enterprises, and Endeavor companies, which um, they're early stage startups. And what I advise them to, and more on the marketing, on the branding side of it, it's like, what is your strategy? What is your essence? And uh, from then, everything should follow now what what are you i can mention you've worked with a lot of clients before you've you you're very experienced you've been doing this in multiple countries now what are some common mistakes that you have seen entrepreneurs or business leaders owners founders what are some of the common mistakes they have made with trying to scale their business too quickly um the most is over over promise or under promise, both, um, and equally impactful. And over promise is that you promise something and you can't fulfill. So your operation is not working towards it. So your client, your consumer, your client is not uh, happy with what you're producing. So that that's one of the things that uh, uh, it works and starts with your fulfillment, with your operations and, and what it is that you can generate. And from them, you you have once you have your clarity is where you're heading and you start your business and then you say okay it's this is not working and you can't scale what's 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 broken so you have to figure out where the where the bottlenecks are where the where the links are broken and figure out the, in terms of fulfillment how you can streamline that customer journey so thinking about the process where you're taking your client throughout your points of contact what is happening and, and the, the, the issues that I think is, is more relevant is people or companies over promising and, and then the experience of your client is just like upsetting. And when you have an upsetting client or upset client, you have negative reviews, you have all this boils down to your reputation and it hurts. So like, what if a client, now let's, let's kind of flip it. The client has gone through the processes They've determined that they are able to scale. What all goes into a growth strategy? What all goes? It has uh, once you're ready and you have your systems and you 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 are consistently um, thinking and executing towards what you and and reviewing what you've done. You're gonna think, okay, my are my growth options, are my growth opportunities that I'm pursuing, are those the ones that help me pivot or help me scale? And that's where you see the big moment where you have been consistent for some time. It might be three months, it might be three years, whatever it is in your line of business, but the consistency plays a, a, a heavy role in terms of your customer wants to. They want to know what to expect. They want they, they want to be assured. They want to be um, satisfied with what you're producing. Once you have that, that is like a snowball effect and goes upward. I don't like snowball. I like more on the this S curve that yeah. it can take you upper um, work. Now, one of the things your organization does, I, I notice online, is you work with your you know external clients and you go through these kind of processes. You you help them with their growth strategy. You help with branding, and then you get to the activation piece. Can you kind of explain a little bit what what does it take to get to that spot, and where do you what does that look like? So once you have your narrative, you have your content pillars. You have what you're you're communicating and how is your experience. We activate what we call the marketing engine. So you have now your core, and then you want to activate that. And that marketing engine needs to work seamlessly. And either if you're activating email campaigns, you're activating social media, you're activating podcast outreach, you're activating different um, elements of the engine that you have, you need to be consistent. So you need to have the content pillars and then your calendar, what you're doing. And 
And the trick is in, in, the, in being consistent. And like I said before, being frequently in the mind of your consumer and recently. So whenever they're going to figure out they need you, they're going to call you because you're there. They know your, your awareness is up um, and consistent with what you want to become. So what I do uh, like about our process is that we generate the core, but it also go hand in hand with our clients going with the marketing engine, activating it for uh, for a year or for nine months so that they can have that uh, working in, in terms of um, it, it gets to a point where I hate it when you deliver just like great, a great deck or a great uh, files and beautiful files and then they are all in the shelf, their bookshelf. And <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. It's like, no, 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 this needs to be active. This needs to work. And that's what I um, I do with our our team. So currently we have a team working for the marketing engines, which is a different profile than the team working with uh, the core uh, projects for our clients. Nice. Now, what advice would you have for some of the listeners at home that are thinking of maybe it's just entrepreneur starting a business, or maybe they're thinking of scaling their business? What what advice would you have for an inspiring entrepreneur? For an inspired uh, is this is this actually what you really love? Is this what actually what you have that question? Be true to yourself because being an entrepreneur, everybody has this romantic idea that you have you own your time and you do this. It's hard work, and you need to love it. You need to understand that it is a, a major um, move change, and it comes with ebbs and flows. It comes with uh, the challenges. And for my advice is like, think through what it is that you want to become. Think through what, uh, what do you feel passionate about? And once you're there, start getting uh, the vision or, the, or the, your ambition uh, super clear, write it and, and go in essence, go, go and, and why is it and why and why. That exercise is, take some time to do that first. Maybe it's, I've seen many entrepreneurs come to me as like, uh, they have like the back of the envelope. I have this app. I want to create this. And okay, what are you solving for? Uh, what, what is it that you're, uh, what is it that you're changing? What is it that you make, want to make better? And having that discussion and the, the questions that you have, like what keeps you up at night? Yeah. And uh, you asked before, it's like, that is, that is when you, when you see the spark in, 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 the, in the person's eyes, it's like, okay, there you have it. And be true to that. And you're going to foresee, you're going to see many challenges. You're going to see inflation. You're going to see recession. You're going to see, I don't know, uh, different aspects of different realities in life. But, uh, I, if you truly believe what you want to generate, I think uh, it, it can be done. Yes. You know, I, one of the things you mentioned earlier was the riches are the niches. You know, find a problem, even if it's a problem that you think it's a niche problem to you, there's a likelihood if you have enough people that are like you that you can scale that into a business. So identify some problems, even if it's a niche problem. Now, Gabriella, how do folks find you? How do they find more information about the business? If clients might be interested, where can they find you on the internet? So I would love for them to call. To call. They can um, actually go at Scalto, our website, S-C-A-L-T-O.com. There is a WhatsApp channel. There is um, emails, their contacts and However, we can address and we can um, help them. We'd love to do that. And we like different channel challenges. So it's not the typical where we have challenges from companies coming from South America to the U.S., from the West Coast to the Hispanics market, from Germany into Miami, uh, or even within Miami. So even within um, U.S. So it's not... Um, it's something that we like to do. It's something that we we think and we absolutely are, are passionate about is get into your why and execute it seamlessly. Nice. Gabriela Polido. Did I get that pronounced? 
Yeah, it's perfect. 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 All right. She so is the founder of Scalto. Thank you so much for joining me today. For those listening at home, please follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and you can sign up for the newsletter. Uh, thank you again and have a great day. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.